the cloud. All right, um, I uh, let me actually enable my camera to see if that works. Yeah. Well, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Wen Ming. I'm a product manager at AWS. So again, we're this is our sixth, I believe. Yeah, the sixth uh, uh, DGL, um, and also uh, uh, folks from uh, KuGraphs at NVIDIA. So DGL is a open source project at AWS, and KuGraph is part of uh, uh, Rapids framework over at NVIDIA. So the two teams have uh, joint force to uh, run this uh, uh, user group. Uh, so Joe Eaton here is uh, one of the uh, um, uh, original sponsors of this. And uh, Joe, you want to say hi to folks? Hello. So we try to do this every every time for people who are new to this. Uh, uh, to the and and you know Joe, you're you're based in Austin, right? And, That's right. Uh, uh, and most of the DGL team is actually, uh, for AWS is actually in Shanghai. And so here we have, you know, Minjie. So we, um, we uh, have just had a, uh, a, 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 one of the major releases of uh, DGL uh, two days ago. Um, and uh, uh, Minjie is uh, here to uh, talk to us about uh, uh, the latest, greatest features of 0 0.7. And more importantly, it's really, uh, here to get uh, uh, everyone's feedback. And if you have specific features you're interested in, and if you are interested in collaborating, um, and of course, you know, we work very closely um, with a lot of the major, uh, uh, major uh, uh, players in the industry, uh, especially uh, NVIDIA and uh, uh, Intel as well, uh, to try to improve the performance of uh, DGL as much as we can. Um, without further ado, I'll let uh, um, Minjie get started on uh, what is new for 0 0.7. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks, Vami, for the introduction. So, hi, everyone. My name is Minjie. So, I'm currently in AWS Shanghai AI Lab. Uh, and I'm also the one that the tech lead of the DGL project. So, uh, I will talk about the latest 0 0.7 release um, uh, in this talk. Uh, let me see. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, I hope everyone has already got the news on various channels we have. Like we have announced the 0 0.7 release, I think just uh, just early this week. And you can now uh, upgrade it uh, by pip install or corner installation. So in this talk, uh, what I wanted to highlight is several uh, notable updates. Uh, in both the system efficiency enhancement and also the new user-facing features. And then lastly, I will um, cover a little bit on what we are heading to after 0 0.7, what is the future roadmap, and uh, prepare for the next big one, that is the 1.0. So let's get started. Uh, first of all, I will talk about the system efficiency enhancements in 0 0.7. Um, one important a uh, very important infrastructure in DGL is the sampling pipeline. Uh, so we know that when a graph is very large, we cannot train on a very uh, large graph because the, the graph is too large to fit in, like uh, uh, in, 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 in your computing device in some, in some, in some sometimes. So uh, what we have right now is a sampling pipeline. So basically we have a large graph and the features, uh, we put it uh, in CPU and then, and then we do neighbor sampling. Uh, neighbor sampling will extract a subgraph based on the, the node you wanted to compute in the representation pool and as well as the features of that subgraph. Once we got the subsampling, we feed it to the model computing device uh, for the model feed forward, backward propagation and gradient update. Uh, so you can see that uh, in, the, in the previous sampling pipeline, uh, the, the original graph and as well as the features are stored on the CPU. And during the sampling process, we need to copy that from CPU to GPU, and then the computation happened on GPU. So there is a, a host to device um, data movement here, which is a, a, a actually a bottleneck in many of the sampling pipeline. So, uh, so in this release, uh, we are thinking about, okay, uh, although it is true that some of the graph is very large, um, cannot fit in one GPU memory, but GPU memory is also is going up very quickly, 
right? Like we have 16 gigabytes GPU, but right now we have 32 or even more, right? So once you have a powerful GPU, we can actually host a relatively large graph. But there's, in previous DGLs, there's no way to enjoy this kind of computation um, power. So in 0 0.7, what we presented here is a new pipeline. It's an all-in GPU pipeline. So you can see here the change is uh, uh, in the original graph and the features are stored in on GPU. Uh, it's already in GPU. And then we have the, G, the new GPU component to do the neighbor sampling, to do the fetching, uh, the, to the feature fetching. And afterwards, uh, because the data is already on GPU, there's no data movement, we can directly feed it to the uh, computer device for model computation. And this is uh, very good for, uh, it's suitable for small to medium sized graph. Uh, as I said, like uh, the, the GPU memory is already pretty large, so we can host a fairly sized graph. And because the GPU has very good parallel computing power and the sampling is actually a, a parallelizable computation. So uh, by putting that on GPU, you can also enjoy the parallel sampling. And uh, what's more is um, the GPU memory is already also have very high bandwidth. So the feature fetching part can also be accelerated as well. So this is a basic idea. And to enable the GPU sampling in, uh, in 0 0.7, uh, uh, this, is the original, uh, this is the original code. Uh, you can see if you, if you have already used DGL before, you can see this is something quite familiar to you. Uh, when you create a graph, you create a node data loader. The data loader is a DGL component uh, for, for you to get the samples from. So you can see once you create a data loader, you can put a full training loop here to get the samples and, and train on the samples. And to enable this GPU sampling, uh, you don't need to do a, a lot of things. First of all, you just move that graph to GPU using this G.2 API, and then specify the device to be Okay, so we, I wanted to do the sampling on GPU as well. And also remember to specify the number of workers to be zero because uh, previously on CPU, we used multiple processes to do the sampling in parallel. But right now, since GPU is pretty fast, we don't need that. So and you need to specify the number of workers to be zero. And once you have that, here you go. You got the uh, GPU enable a uh, GPU based sampling pipeline. And uh, what we tried uh, on some experiments show that, okay, we got like, uh, more than 10x speed up for training a graph stage model on uh, OGBM product. So note that the OGBM product is not a small graph, actually. It is, um, I, I believe it has like um, millions of edges. So it is uh, like a medium sized graph. So you can see uh, once you have a powerful GPU, you can actually run the entire pipeline GPU uh, with no problem. And, and we also wanted to thanks for NVIDIA and uh, especially Dominic. Uh, he will be talking about a lot of different features next uh, for, for the contribution of this new feature. Okay, so this is the, uh, the, for the sampling, uh, sampling acceleration. Uh, the, other, uh, the other notable update is the message parsing kernel. So we know that uh, message parsing is very core to GN computation. And in DGL, we use um, a kernel called SPMM. So it's, uh, it is short for sparse dense matrix multiplication. Uh, to implement uh, this GM message passing. So it's very important. And in this release, uh, we also accelerate that SPMM CPU kernel uh, by, uh, by advanced optimization, like tiling the sparse matrix A so that the workload of each CPU thread can fit in the last level cache size. And this increase the data locality of SPMM kernel, so make it very efficient. And we also utilize Intel's libxsmm um, JIT compiler uh, to generate that kernel on the fly. So the kernel can be tuned according to the workload size uh, the, uh, you, you provided. And the result is also very promising. Uh, so you can see this is the benchmark result we have uh, for SPMM with different feature sizes. And you can see the G flops of that SPMM kernel actually increases by a lot, um, by up to like six times. And uh, this is all thanks to the contribution from Intel, especially Sanchez uh, for this new kernel. Okay, 
So the, uh, apart from the notable updates, uh, the two not not notable updates I, I just talked about, uh, there are many other improvements. Uh, for example, in DGL uh, 0 0.7, uh, the sparse node embedding module uh, now utilizes a media nickel to transmit these gradient and synchronize among them. And the, this actually gives a 20% speed. I mean, this actually, basically, uh, this is actually a, a very, like we, we just tested uh, roughly, but I, we believe this will give you even more speed up uh, if you have a better hardware. So uh, what we tested is it actually gives you 20% speed up for some workload. And also we have some optimization on the sampling side, the, the random walk sampling is improved by a lot. On some on some on some large, uh, medium to large size graphs, uh, because uh, because we fix some uh, we fix some of the like fine grain thread scheduling problem uh, pre, uh, that that is, that is like before zero point seven, and also for distributed training uh, we also have like uh, uh, a performance improvement on the memory consumption because we know that when you have a larger graph you want to fit that large graph in uh, in a cluster right so we don't want the memory to be very consumption to be very high. And this is uh, the optimization we have, uh, we have done in 0 0.7, which actually drops the memory consumption by 7x for the, for the workload split, split stage. So there are many other, this kind of improvements in 0 0.7. If you're interested, you can check out the release note uh, and you will see a list of them. Okay, the next one I will cover is some notable new user facing features. So first of all, uh, as usual, in each release, we will upload a batch of uh, model examples to the repository. So, um, and we know that this is quite important for, especially for researchers, because you wanted to uh, find the models and uh, use that as a baseline or modify a point to do your own innovation, right? So uh, in this release, we uh, upload 19 new model examples. So bringing the total number of models to be over 90. And uh, because of this, we also created a small search interface on DGL.ai. So if you, uh, so I wanted to demonstrate this a little bit. So if you uh, go to the DGL website, DGL.ai, you can see this is our new homepage. And uh, when you scroll down, you can see this is a new search tool. It is called find an example to get started. And here you can actually select a bunch of different uh, different keywords, or you can even search the keywords just by, by typing that. And once you find, uh, for example, I wanted to study the clustering algorithm, and you can see this is the page, the, the paper title, and also the text according to that. And I can cl click it; it will uh, jump uh, to the link in our GitHub, and you can see uh, this is the paper name and also the example code in PyTorch. And then click that and find the example folder uh, of and also the paper and some results. And you can use that from here. So um, we believe that this tool can help the researcher a lot because you, got, you guys wanted to find examples. And uh, we have actually tagged all our examples with keywords. And you can see this is actually a word cloud of all the different kind of keywords of our model examples. Um, it's, it's interesting to see that most of the examples right now are still like focusing on node classification. Uh, but we will see, and we hope to see more, more and more contributions or examples of different topics in the future. Okay, so uh, besides the model parts, we also have updates on the tutorials as well. Uh, so in 0 0.7, our tutorial is focusing on the uh, multi-GPU and distributed training. So right now, if you go to docs.dgl.ai, which is the documentation side of DGL, you will find uh, three new tutorials. Uh, uh, they are for training um, node classification and uh, graph classification and some multiple GPUs, and also a, uh, a tutorial for uh, teaching you how to train a node classification GNs on multiple ma machines distributed. Okay. Uh, of course, there are many other new features. Uh, for example, we have new APIs for node to back random work and also fast KN graph construction and uh, all these kind of different new APIs. Uh, and if you want to see a full list of them, again, check out the release notes and, uh, and you can also download the, uh, the, the new DGL right now and see the new updates. Okay, 
So finally, uh, I'd like to uh, briefly mention about the plan after 0 0.7. So what is after 0 0.7? It will be 1.0 actually. So this will be the first stable release of the GL. We wanted to uh, present stable API. So you can expect all the APIs will be more stable uh, from now on after 1.0. And uh, we will also uh, like further uh, continue actually polish our documentation. So we wanted to make documentation suitable for all different levels of users. Right now, uh, we our documentation is usually focused on uh, like users, right? Uh, but we also wanted to have documentations for developers. Uh, we know that a lot of them, uh, a lot of you guys wanted to like actually hack into DGI and see whether we can modify it. So this, the, the documentation is the next focus of us. And uh, for the infrastructure side, uh, we want our infrastructure to support all kinds of scenarios, like the all in GPU scenario, mix the CPU and GPU training, or even use external memory. And we believe that all these scenarios have their usage because your graph will have different scales and you have different kind of hardware. So we want DGL to support all these different scenarios. And finally, uh, we will continue to support uh, all the ecosystem and community, hopefully. And you, as you can see right now, like a lot of our highlight uh, features is already contributed by our user community. And we hope to see more of them in the future. I think that's all I wanted to share for 0 0.7 and also after 0 point, the plan after 0 0.7. And uh, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, thank you, Mingjie. Uh, is there any questions? We have a couple of minutes for uh, questions. Okay, we'll move on to our second speaker. Um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, uh, you know, ask me in the Slack channel. Um, I already actually had a bunch of people pinging me um, about uh, um, the, the feature questions already. So, so if you feel shy, definitely uh, uh, you know, ping ming directly on Slack channel and uh, we would love to uh, be able to help you. So next we have Dominic. Um, and Dominic has been one of the, um, I would say, most uh, uh, important collaborator that uh, uh, DGL has. We're very lucky to um, have you as a collaborator. So he's going to be talking to you about storing no features in GPU memory to speed up billion scale GNN training. And Dominic, the floor is yours. Thank you, Wenming. It's been a real pleasure over the past year getting to, to work with the DGL team. Um, it's been great working with such talented folks. Um, so today I'll talk to you about uh, storing the note features in GPU memory. Um, you know, why we want to do this, what's new in DGL 0.7 that allows this to be done. Uh, and then finally, you know, what, what is that impact on training runtime? So to, to store node features in aggregate GPU memory, what we'd really like to do is take our large set of features F and split it up in some way and store it in the different uh, GPUs memory. Because an individual GPU, you know, will have tens of gigabytes of memory. Um, but in a system with eight GPUs, you may have hundreds of gigabytes of aggregate GPU memory that you'd like to take advantage of. Then we look at uh, training mini batches in uh, graph neural networks. We will have the, our uh, training graph. You know, we'll take a subgraph of that to get to GI. Um, and then we'll have our set of node features. We'll slice that down to the set of node features for our mini batch, pass those into our model to get our outputs. And when we look at the data movement um, inside each step of training on this mini batch, uh, we'll generally have the graph on the CPU, as well as the node features. We'll generate that subgraph on the CPU as well, slice down our node features on the CPU, and then we'll copy those across PCI Express up to our GPU, where we can then pass them through our model. However, when we look at the speed of different components of our system, um, here we can see on the left, we kind of have the slower ones, and then 
uh, on the right, we have those with the, the highest bandwidth. So PCI Express uh, version three, you know, will have a peak of 16 gigabytes a second. Version four is at 32 gigabytes a second. When we look at um, CPU memory bandwidth and uh, GPU to GPU interconnects, we're talking about hundreds of gigabytes a second um, in bandwidth. And then, you know, today's high end GPUs um, are actually going past a terabyte of second of memory bandwidth. And so what we'd really like to do is, is move as much as we can kind of down the scale into the much higher bandwidth components of our system to really maximize our performance. So inside a mini batch, um, as Minjay had mentioned, uh, the subgraph will actually tend to be very sparse once we've sampled it um, throughout the layers. It'll look very tree-like. We'll have a little bit of overlap between layers, but for a sufficiently large graph in general, the number of edges will be very similar to the, the number of vertices within our mini batch. Um, as such, the graph structure is pretty small, um, but the, the node features themselves will be several times larger because for example, in this case where we have 11 vertices and uh, input feature dimension of only 64, we'll have 704 features that we'll need to transfer to the GPU. Um, while the graph structure itself is just 11 vertices and 13 edges and is very small by comparison, uh, which is why in this talk focusing on node features um, and not on the graph structure itself. So one option that exists today is if we have uh, a GPU with sufficient memory, you can just store all the node features there, um, or you can duplicate them in the case where you have multiple GPUs. That way you're able to make use of that G, uh, the high bandwidth GPU memory, um, and you can do your sampling on the CPU, or as Minjay mentioned, in the case of 0 0.7, you can actually do that on the GPU now in the case for one GPU. But when we get to a very large graph where the feature data no longer fits inside GPU memory, um, we kind of have to do it in this way, where we'll put the feature data into shared memory. Um, where we have one process per GPU so that we can run Python in parallel. And then all those processes read from that shared memory on the CPU to slice down to their data for their mini batch, copy that across PCI Express up to uh, the GPU each process is working on. Um, but in this case, not only are we kind of bottlenecked by that speed of PCI Express, um, on the CPU, we hit a lot of resource contention trying to uh, create all these slices in parallel. So one of the new things in DGL 0.7 is um, integration with the Nickel library, which allows communication between GPUs. Uh, and two of the functions added to DGL um, are this sparse all-to-all -all push, which allows taking a set of indices and associated set of values and sending them out in specific messages to each GPU in the system. So it's uh, similar to an MPI all to all V, but specific with a set of indices and a set of values. And then our partition object here is what determines which indices go to which GPUs. Uh, and then kind of the reverse of that operation, we have the sparse all to all pull, which uh, you'll have a set of requested indices that you'll send out um, to the other GPUs in the system based on the partition. And they'll fulfill those requests by sending back uh, the values associated with those indices. And these two functions are currently used inside DGL's node embedding, um, which is where the sparse all to all pull happens. So basically you're able to gather your embedding from all the GPUs um, using the sparse all to all pull. And then in the sparse optimizers, the sparse all to all push is used to send out the gradients to the, to the GPUs that are assigned uh, to those rows of the embedding. So to make use of these, this new functionality, in order to store our node features on the GPU, um, there's a little bit of, of uh, Python code to wrap around that to, to facilitate it. And that's currently in this PR against DGL right now, number 3021. And it adds um, this multi-GPU tensor class. And so what this enables us to do is take our large set of features inside CPU shared memory and split that up across the GPUs in the system so that we can pull feature data directly from the GPUs 
rather than having to pull it from CPU memory. And so what this looks like then as we generate our mini batch uh, when running on multiple GPUs is there'll basically be this all to all operation as uh, every GPU performs this slice on this multi GPU tensor. And they all communicate across that interconnect. Um, because it uses nickel, that interconnect can be um, you know, NV link, very high bandwidth, but also in a system that just has PCI Express um, and no interconnection between the GPUs, it'll then smartly utilize that PCI Express to this communication without copying the data back down to the CPU. The interface for this class um, is kind of split up into how you need to, to set it up across your GPUs and then how you can go about uh, using it inside your training step. So first we need to create the new uh, multi-GPU tensor, providing the global shape of the tensor across all GPUs, the type of value we're storing in it, the GPU associated with a given process, and then the nickel communicator object used to communicate between GPUs. Then finally, we can take our feature data stored currently in shared memory, pass that into this all set global function, which will then have the local process slice out the set of features it's responsible and copy it up to its GPU. Then during the forward step, um, where we used to simply slice out our CPU features using the, the set of input nodes and then copying that to the GPU, we now call the all gather row function and pass in our set of input nodes there. And that generates the batch inputs tensor on our GPU um, using this interface. The reason it doesn't overload the get item uh, operator is that because this is using a collective communication operation under the hood, all processors need to call this function simultaneously. So the, the nomenclature there with the all gather uh, is to denote that to the user that not just one GPU or one process can call this, but they all have to, uh, to avoid having to wait on other GPUs. So then to evaluate the performance on this, we looked at the GraphSage network uh, with two layers. Um, and in this example, we ran it with 128 hidden dimensions on the OGBN products data set. Um, this has uh, two and a half million nodes um, and we have 100 input features associated with each one. And so here we're comparing storing the feature data uh, purely in shared memory on the CPU. And that's in the orange bar on the left. Uh, the middle bar in dark green is where we take this feature data and we duplicate it on every GPU in the system. And then the bar on the right, which is where we use this multi-GPU tensor, and we split that data across all the GPUs in the system. And in this system, we're looking at, uh, it has eight uh, V132 gigabyte GPUs. They're all connected by NVLink in this case. Um, and so one thing to note here is that the duplicating the features on the GPU kind of represents the speed of light in terms of how we can get feature data uh, to the appropriate GPUs. Um, because there we don't actually have to communicate with any other GPUs, all the features data is there and it just gets sliced into the mini batch right on that GPU where it is. And in the case where we actually have to communicate through the interconnect, we can see for almost all cases, we're about 10 to 15% slower, um, which is still pretty competitive considering that this uh, data is actually striped across the GPUs. So in the eight GPU case, seven eighths of the features it's fetching are from other GPUs. Uh, and only one eighth is from the local GPU. When we look at memory usage of this, um, here we can see on using just a single GPU, the duplicating the node features and splitting them are identical because all the node features reside on that single GPU. And we use almost two gigabytes worth of GPU memory. Um, Whereas when the features are stored on the CPU, we use about 800 megabytes of GPU memory for things associated with the mini batch um, and just kind of workspace uh, for PyTorch as well. But as we start increasing the number of GPUs used, we see the amount of GPU memory used by the multi-GPU tensor when it's split on the GPUs keeps falling down. Um, 
to the point where it's only using 200 megabytes more of GPU memory um, with eight GPUs as compared to storing the features on the CPU. And it's this memory scalability that enables us to then run on much larger graphs where the features themselves wouldn't fit on any single GPU. And so here we're looking at the OGBN papers 100 million uh, graph, which has 111 million nodes and 1.6 billion edges. Um, in this case, we're also running a two layer graph sage. Uh, but we've bumped up the hidden dimensions to 1024. And this has 128 input features per node. On the left here, we're running it with a relatively small fan out. So in this case, we don't have that many uh, node features per mini batch because we only expand at every layer by eight, um, eight neighbors of each node. And in this case, we see a little over a 2x speed up um, in the in training per epoch, dropping from 5.7 seconds down to 2.1 seconds when split across these eight V100 GPUs. But it's an even bigger difference when we have a larger fan out. In the case on here on the right, where we uh, have a fan out of 30 at each layer. And so we have a much larger amount of feature data per mini batch. Um, we're almost four times faster splitting the node features across the GPUs than by storing them in shared memory. So kind of the next steps for this work um, are improving that the way the, the data is split across GPUs. As I said, currently it's stripes. So you end up really putting a lot of pressure on that interconnect between GPUs. Um, as almost all the data has to get exchanged for each mini batch. Currently, DGL inside disk DGL supports using graph partition, graph partitioning to create communication minimizing partitions. Uh, and incorporating that into here uh, is kind of the next step so that we can further reduce the amount of pressure that's put on this interconnect and get even more performance. Uh, and then what goes hand in hand with that is expanding into the disk DGL setting where we can use multiple machines to store the node features and scale to even larger graphs. As I said before, this is currently out in a pull request against DGL. And it'd be great to hear any feedback on the interface um, or in terms of experience with performance and two uh, to try and make DGL even better in this setting. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, hi, it's uh, Leo from Graphistry. So first of all, this is awesome. This is uh, just really great to see. And it's just like very quality work. So thank you. Um, so the, I, I guess, uh, two uh, kind of just practical in the weeds questions uh, in, in terms of future work. One is, uh, um, how are you thinking about uh, edge features? Like I assume that, that you're thinking about them. And then second is um, we actually use QDF and Das QDF for um, basically representing uh, our property graphs, like a like a nodes data frame and edges data frame. And so I'm curious about uh, kind of combining the two, especially when that means our features are often already in memory. Uh, so for in terms of edge features, this this should work exactly the same for edge features as it does for node features. Uh, the reason I talked about node features here is, is that's uh, what this data set has. Um, I, I didn't have a, a ready data set prepared, prepared with, with edge features of this scale. Um, but essentially, it's, it's nothing specific to the features themselves, and it's just a kind of an arbitrary tens uh, two-dimensional tensor. So whether it's node features or edge features uh, should work all in the same way. So the one change that would need to be made there um, is simply the way that the batch inputs are gathered. But you could still get your set of edge IDs and then slice those out to create the, the set of edge features for your mini batch. Um, as far as interfacing with QDF, I, I wish I could tell you I was familiar enough to say whether or not it would work. I think that would depend on how it supports uh, DL pack and whether or not you could simply convert the tensor out of that um, and use that here. So there's, there's a couple of functions I left out that's in this multi-GPU tensor, which is the ability to modify the local 
uh, set of weights or, or the local, basically local tensor. Um, so I think it probably, if you had one partitioning set out of QDF, you'd probably have to do a little bit of slicing to get it into the proper state to, to pass that into here. Did I, did I address that? Yeah, I'm actually, I'm like looking at Joe on the participants list. I don't know if, if he's familiar or he may be just lurking, but yeah, okay, that, that, that's good. So like, we just need to look at DL pack. Like I, I remember seeing some stuff uh, about that. So um, that, that's a good clue. But right. I, if... DL pack will let you pass it with zero copy. Yeah. yeah. But uh, please, please comment on the PR with that, that use case. That'll be great to keep in mind for us. Uh, yeah, feel free to post it in the chat menu and I can do it right now. So what's the largest machine you tested this on, Dominique? Uh, that was it, the, uh, the, the 8V132 gigabytes. Didn't have a chance to run it on any shiny new A100s or even the... Uh, the kind of odd 16 GPU machines yet. Okay, yeah, it, it, I expect it'll be even better on those, so. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering about the same thing. I was wondering if any of the sparse matrix features on A100 would have uh, helped in any way, or would you have to specifically program for uh, those I, to my I don't believe DGL currently would benefit from the, the sparse tensor cores. Okay, thanks. But the, uh, the, the A100s actually have twice the, the bandwidth in terms of, of NVLink interconnect. So there you'd see a big, big speed up in terms of exchanging this data. Yeah, that's great. I think it will be really cool to see at least how well the uh, NACL performs on a multi-node system of any kind. Um, but of course, you know, that's probably uh, uh, down the road. I mean, this is a fairly new implementation, but this is, you know, really exciting uh, new work. Any other questions, folks? Okay, well, thank you, Dominic. Um, again, you know, we're very much appreciative of all the contribu contributions you've uh, uh, done for uh, DGL, and uh, we look forward to uh, more collaboration. Well, thank you. It's been my pleasure getting to work with you all. Great. So our next speaker, and Sina, are you able to uh, share your screen? Great. Uh, all right. Yes. I'll let you set up and uh, yeah. So Sina is gonna be talking to us about locally private graph neural networks. And uh, he, uh, so he is from the Adelaide Research Institute in Switzerland. Um, apologize, I couldn't uh, really pronounce that properly. So, no worries. Yeah. And thank okay. you well, and welcome. Okay, thank you very much for the int introduction and thank you for the invitation. Uh, well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Sina. Uh, uh, I'm doing my PhD at EPFL and EDI Research Institute. Today I'm gonna talk about locally private graph neural networks, which is basically a privacy preserving GNN architecture for uh, protecting node data privacy. I will just explain a little bit more. Um, well, uh, uh, the problem that we addressed uh, in this work is graph learning with no data privacy. So, so here's the setting. Assume that we have a server, like a social network server that has access to a graph, like the social graph. Uh, and uh, each node of this graph, which uh, may correspond to a real human user, has uh, some sort of private data. Okay, in the shape of maybe features or labels that are kept private, but uh, can be useful for the server to train a GNN over this graph. 
Okay, so the journey, so the server wishes to use this private data in order to train uh, its own GNN for its own good. So uh, the problem is that how we can let the server train this GNN without giving up private node data. Okay. Uh, our solution is to preserve the privacy of nodes using a uh, local differential privacy. So I would assume not everybody here is familiar with uh, uh, local differential privacy. So I uh, quickly review this concept. So uh, local differential privacy is actually the de facto standard for uh, privacy preserving data analytics, where there are uh, some uh, data holders or data generators that has some private data. And uh, we also have a data aggregator who wishes to uh, calculate a, an aggregated statistics over, over the private data, but the, 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 the aggregator, the data aggregator is not trusted. So the data holders do not want to share their data directly with the server, with the aggregator. So what we do in local DP is to uh, is that each each data holder uh, instead of sending their data directly to 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 the aggregator uh, perturb their data using some sort of randomized mechanism, okay? Perhaps by adding some sort of random noise, and then send this this perturbed data to the aggregator. This perturbed data is is meaningless uh, individually, but uh, when they are aggregated. They can actually est they can uh, approximate the the, the, tar the target uh, statistic that uh, the aggregator would, would like to calculate. Okay, in other words, the noise that the, the data holders add to to their data uh, cancel out through aggregation. So uh, here's the definition of uh, the exact definition of local differential privacy it says that a randomized mechanism M that these data holders use to, to perturb their data satisfies epsilon LDP, where epsilon is a, is a parameter greater than zero, if for all pairs of private data, x1 and x2, and for all outputs x prime of m, we have this, this inequality. It says that the probability of uh, inputting x1 and getting the output x prime is kind of similar to the probability of getting the same output with another input x2, okay? And this similarity is captured by this parameter epsilon here, okay? Which is called the privacy budget or privacy loss in the literature. And the closer this epsilon is to zero, the more similar will be these two probability distributions and the more privacy we have, but we get uh, worse accuracy, okay? And vice versa. So the intuition behind this definition is that uh, in, uh, any two, any two inputs is as likely to produce a certain output. Okay, so if the server, if the, if the aggregator looks at the output, uh, he could not distinguish whether it came from X1 or whether it came from X2, okay? So this is, this is essentially the, uh, the concept of local DP. So let's get back to our problem. Why a local DP is deemed to be useful to solve this particular problem? Actually, this is due to the way that graph neural networks uh, operate as, as message passing neural networks. Well, I'm, I'm sure uh, all of you are familiar with, with uh, message passing neural networks. Uh, and we all have seen different formulations of, of message passing neural networks. Well, in its uh, most uh, sim uh, in its simplest form, it consists of two steps. The first is, is aggregate step where every node aggregates uh, features or representations from its neighbors. And uh, the second step is, is, is update a step where the disaggregation is fed into a neural network to, to generate a new representation, okay? So uh, this is a very simple two layer graph neural network where at the first layer, the node features are aggregated using the information from graph topology. And then the resulting vectors is, are, are fed into the update function, the neural network to get a new representation. And this procedure is repeated for the next layer to, to, to get the output, okay? 
So in our problem, node features are private, okay? And uh, the server in the very first step wants to calculate an aggregate function. So it is very similar to, to the scenario of local differential privacy, okay? If we consider uh, nodes as data holders and the, the server wishes to evaluate the, uh, the, the aggregate function as, as the data aggregator, this is completely similar to the scenario of local BP. So, so the idea here is to uh, perturb these node features by injecting some sort of noise and then uh, send the result to the server and then the server runs this aggregate function over these uh, noisy features, which acts like a denoising mechanism. It can cancel out the, the noise uh, in, in the neighborhood, neighborhood aggregation, okay? But there are some challenges. The first challenge is that we have, we usually have high dimensional features. Okay, so, so in, in, in local differential privacy, informally speaking, if you have a lot of features for each, feature, for each individual feature, you need to spend some privacy budget in order to perturb it. Okay, so the total privacy budget of a node scales with the number of features. Okay, so uh, this, this will be a lot of uh, budget for if, if we have high dimensional features that can, you know, in, in practice, we don't have any privacy. In order to keep the total privacy budget small, uh, we, we, need to, we need to inject more nodes, which would be bad for, for accuracy. The GNN would not be accurate anymore. Okay, so this is one challenge that we, we need to address. Another challenge is that for, for LDP to be able, for, for, the aggregate, for the aggregation to be able to cancel out the noise in LDP, we need to run the aggregation over a large set, over a large population, okay? But actually in, 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 in the language of graphs, it means that the, we need to run the aggregate, we, we need uh, an, a node to have uh, many neighbors, okay? So, so the neighborhood aggregation is run over, over all the neighbors, okay? But uh, we know that in many real world graphs, like social networks that follow uh, power law degree distribution, there are a lot of nodes that have only a few neighbors. Okay, and this is bad for, for our problem because the noise won't cancel out in, in this case and remains in the system and deteriorates the accuracy. Okay, so these are the, the two challenges, the two initial challenges that, that we need to address that I will talk about. Okay, so for the, for the first challenge for high dimensional features, we propose multi-bit mechanism for multi-dimensional perturbation. It basically consists of two components. The first component that runs at the user side, at node side, is multi-bit encoder that is used for feature selection, perturbation, and compression. And the second component, the multi-bit rectifier, is used for the de uh, de decompression and debiasing and is run at server side. Okay. So for the first component, the encoder, uh, we do like this. Instead of perturbing all the, all the features, let's say we have D features for, for each node, instead of perturbing all of them, we sample uh, a few, few of them, okay? We, we sample M out of D features, okay? And then we perturb these, these M samples, each of these M, M features with uh, epsilon over M privacy budget, okay? With this mechanism, which is called a multi-bit mechanism. Uh, let, uh, let X V and I be, be the feature uh, of node V at the dimension I. Alpha and beta are the range of the feature. Okay, the, the upper bound and lower bound of the, lower bound and upper bound of the, of the feature. And epsilon is the privacy budget and M is the number of, uh, number of samples. Okay, so what we do is to sample from, from this Bernoulli distribution with this parameter, and this will be our, our perturbed feature, okay? The corresponding perturbed feature, okay? It is easy to show that this, 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 uh, this actually this mechanism satisfies epsilon over M LDP. And then since we are running uh, this, this, uh, this mechanism M times, in total, we get uh, epsilon DP uh, based on the composition theorem of differential privacy, okay? So, so this, this, uh, the output of this Bernoulli distribution will be either zero or one, but we map it to be either minus one or one. 
and we save zero for all the non-perturbed features for, for D minus M features that we did not perturb because they did not were part of the samples. Okay. So for those features, we return zero. And for, for those features that we perturbed, we, we return either minus one or one, depending on the outcome of this Bernoulli distribution. Okay, and we send the result to, to, to the server. Now, uh, the, the, the outcome of this uh, mechanism is, is biased. Okay, the expectation of this X star is not equal to, to, the, tr to the true feature. Okay, so what the rectifier uh, do is to uh, is to debias the the encoded feature by re reversing the, the the encoder's mapping. Okay, so we get the the uh, the, the encoded feature and we do some calculation in order to debias it. But note that this this value still is still noisy. It is not equal to the to the initial feature. Okay, it's noisy. Uh, so, so the server cannot learn about the private feature. But it's only equal to this, to this uh, initial feature in expectation. Okay, so for the second challenge for small neighborhoods, our, our uh, solution is to expand the neighborhood around the node to include not only its immediate neighbors, but, its, uh, uh, but those nodes that are up to k hops away from that node, okay? And we do this by applying simply by applying k consecutive linear aggregate functions, okay, without any nonlinearity in between. So we, we do not apply the, the, the update function in between. We, we just apply k consecutive linear aggregate functions. And I say linear because it uh, is a requirement for, for, the aggregate, for, for the aggregate function to be able to, to, to denoise the features in order to cancel out the noise, okay. So for instance, uh, the, the average is okay, the sum is okay, but, but maximum is not okay because you, can, you cannot cancel out the noise with maximum, okay? What we do in practice in our experiments is that we use GCN uh, aggregate function because it's a linear combination of features, okay? And then uh, we can prepend this, this process, this, uh, this layer that we simply call it KProp to any GNN architecture, okay? Such as graph convolutional networks, graph attention networks, and so on. Okay, you can use with any other, with any GNN architecture. So uh, as an overview, this is our locally private GNN architecture. So at the user side, we, we get the private feature, we apply, we give it to the uh, multi-bit encoder to get the perturbed node feature and send it to the server. Now the server uh, debias the, the encoded feature using a multi-bit rectifier and then uses kprop in order to denoise de the features. And then uh, it uh, gives the denoise feature to the GNN to, to, to get the, uh, to the estimated uh, posterior class probabilities if, if the task is node classification, okay? Note that for training, the training is, is done completely on server side. This, this uh, Sending from uh, user side to server side, server side is only is done only once. Okay, so so this is quite straightforward. If the the server has uh, the labels for training, okay. But what if uh, the labels themselves are private? Okay, so if the labels are private. Uh, in order to keep the model locally private, we need to also apply local differential privacy on labels. Okay, so for this case, we use a randomized response mechanism, which is a quite well-known mechanism for categorical uh, value perturbation. So it's like this. Um, let's denote true labels by Y, uh, perturbed labels by a Y prime. Uh, C is the number of classes and epsilon is like the four uh, uh, differential privacy uh, budgets, okay? So, uh, uh, this is the this is the randomized response mechanism. So it basically says that we we keep the label as is with this probability, with, which depends on privacy budget epsilon and the number of uh, classes. But otherwise, we just um, choose a, a random another random class. Okay. 
So this is the, the randomized response mechanism. So we, we perturb the features using this mechanism, sorry, we, we perturb the labels using this mechanism and uh, we, we send them uh, to the server. And here is what we had before, okay? So, so these, these features, th these labels, these uh, the outcome of the randomized response mechanism are noisy, okay? These labels are noisy. So if we uh, train the GNN with these noisy labels, it will be obvious that the GNN overfits the, the noise in the labels and then it will generalize poorly, okay? So uh, we, need a we, we need a mechanism, we need a way in order to denoise the labels like what we did for the features, okay? So uh, our idea is to apply KProp also for label denoising, label denoising, okay? So before, earlier, we used KProp in order to denoise the, the features. And now we, we follow the same idea to denoise the labels. Okay, so uh, we, we, we convert the labels to one hot encoding and then we apply KProp to, with, with, with a different uh, parameter than, than the feature KProp to actually denoise the, the labels. And then we, we pick the label with the, with the highest value as the outcome of the KProp, okay? And then we, uh, we, we train the GNN using, using these uh, recovered labels, okay? So in order to see how effective it is, uh, we, we did this experiment. We uh, calculated the accuracy between the true label Y and the recovered label Y tilde, okay? So uh, what we did was first, we perturbed the true labels with randomized response mechanism using three different uh, privacy budget, epsilon equal to one, two, and three. And then we, we gave them to, to the KProp with different step parameters, okay? And then we calculate the accuracy of the, uh, the, accuracy of the outcome against the true labels, okay? So uh, we did this experiment for, for, for three data sets, Facebook with four classes, Cora with seven classes, and LastFM with 10 classes. As you can see, for instance, on Facebook with four classes, uh, without KProp, when, when the step parameter is zero, the, the label accuracy is below 50%, but with uh, K equal to like six, we get over 80% accuracy for the labels. Okay, so this is very effective. And this is more effective actually when, when the number of classes is high. For instance, with last time in 10 classes, we, uh, we get like below 20% when we do not have KProp, but with uh, KProp with uh, like uh, step parameter 15, we get like 80% accuracy. So this is quite acceptable accuracy that we can, you know, get using this, this process. But we have one important challenge and is that we actually don't have any clean validation data to find the best performing K, okay? So because of privacy, we assume that the server does not have any uh, true labels, does not have any clean labels in order to plot these figures and find out the best K, okay? So the question is how to find the best performing K without any clean validation data. So uh, if, uh, one, one other thing that we can see here is that, uh, you know, when, when increasing the, the step parameter K, the, the, the accuracy increases up to a point and then it starts to fall down. Okay, so, so this is perhaps due to the, the oversmoothing. But one thing to note is that the, the noise here is, is very similar to, to the noise uh, due to the randomized response, but the noise after the fall, falling down the accuracy is kind of a different noise. It has a different nature, okay? So we need to also find out a way in order to prevent overfitting to, to these two kinds of noise. Okay, so in or, first, in order to prevent uh, um, overfitting to the noise in, in Y tilde, when the K prop uh, parameter is large, we do like this. 
Okay, so, so we want our GNN to predict the true labels, right? And for the true labels, what we did was to apply randomized response on true labels to get Y prime, which is the noisy labels. And uh, we applied K prop to, to get the, the recovered labels, Y tilde, okay? So in order to you know, have the consistency between, between these two, we apply the same process that we applied on Y on the predictions, okay? So we, we apply a randomized response and K-prop on, on true labels. So for, for the predictions, we also do the same. We apply randomized response on the predictions to, to get the, 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 uh, the predictions for noisy labels. And then we apply K-prop on these predictions to get the predictions for recovered labels somehow, okay? And then what we do is to use the cross-entropy between these two to train the GNN, okay? This way we can kind of keep the base GNN, keep the, the predictions uh, away from the, the effect of the K-prop uh, that we have here. Okay, and one thing to note is that these two K props are identical. Okay, they have the same exact same parameter. Okay, but actually this is not sufficient because uh, K prop when when the the, the step parameter in K, this K prop is small, then these two uh, these two values y prime and y, y tilde would be similar. So again, uh, the GNN will begin to overfit the noise the noise which is uh, due to the randomized response. So what we do here is that we know with, with what probability the, the label Y prime is equal to Y. Okay, so if we get back to the, to the randomized response, we know that with this probability, the, the, the noisy label is equal to, to the true label, okay? So what does that mean? It means that it means that uh, the the expected accuracy for for the for the noisy labels cannot be beyond this 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 value. Okay. In other words, if if the GNN if this GNN becomes a, a perfect classifier, meaning that it has a one hundred percent accuracy when predicting the true labels, then the accuracy of this GNN, okay, for predicting the noisy labels over the training data should not be beyond, should not be over this value, over this threshold, okay? If the GNN uh, reaches a point where its accuracy for predicting the noisy label is over this, this value, we know that the GNN is overfitting to the noise, okay? So we monitor this accuracy during training. And as soon as this, this accuracy gets over this threshold, we stop the training. So, so this way we could somehow re regularize uh, the training in order to prevent the, the GNN to overfit the noise. So here's the, the overall algorithm, label the noising with, with propagation or simply drop. So the GNN uh, outputs the predicted uh, true labels. And uh, with true labels here, we apply randomized response to get Y prime noisy labels. And then we apply K prop to get uh, recover labels. For the predictions, we do the same. We apply randomized response to get the uh, predictions of the noisy labels. And then we, we apply K prop to uh, get the predictions for uh, recovered labels and we calculate this cross entropy for the training. And also we monitor this accuracy between these two in order to stop the training at the right moment. And when, uh, when the training is done for, the, for evaluation or for, for the validation, we, we calculate the, the cross entropy loss between the noisy labels and the noisy predictions which, is, which has been shown in the literature to be an unbiased uh, loss function for, 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 for the loss, for the, for the cross entropy loss between the, between the true labels and, and their predictions. Okay, so, so, so we have something for, for model comparison when we change the, the K-prop parameters. 
So let's go to the experimental results. Here is the, uh, first we, we, uh, we evaluate the G, uh, L, uh, LPGNN's performance under uh, varying feature and uh, label privacy budgets. So we, we varied uh, feature privacy budget, epsilon x, within this, this range, 0 0.01, 0 0.1, 1, 2, 3, and infinity. infinity. Infinity corresponds to the case where we actually do not perturb the features. And similarly, uh, we, we uh, we have a set for uh, changing the value of a privacy budget for labels, epsilon y. We change them in uh, for epsilon y equal to one, two, three, and infinity. And uh, I used the graph sage model as the base GNN. And I, here I show you the result over Facebook and last data datasets. So as you can see, for instance, on the Facebook dataset, we see that the when we decrease the, the uh, epsilon x, the privacy budget for features, we get uh, very little variations in the accuracy. Okay, so, so, the, so the LPGNN is very robust when, even when the uh, epsilon of x, when the privacy budget is, is very small. Okay, so uh, if, if, you, if you want to compare the, 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 the accuracy difference when we do not have privacy and when we have uh, maximum privacy is, is below 5% in this case, okay? And uh, uh, if you look at the variations, when we change the, uh, when we change the uh, uh, label privacy, label privacy budget, we see that uh, it's a little bit, the, the accuracy loss is a little bit more than the accuracy loss in the uh, feature case but still is quite acceptable. So, so for instance, it, it is not more than five, six, seven percent. And it's quite, uh, almost quite the same for the last FM data sets, uh, which have a uh, uh, higher number of classes. Uh, as we can see, for instance, at most 10% uh, accuracy loss we get uh, when we uh, have label privacy against the case where we do not have label privacy. Uh, next, we, we compared uh, two, uh, two different uh, GNN architectures over the Facebook data set. So here we used a graph convolutional networks and graph attention networks. As you can see, the graph convolutional networks also shows the same result as the graph sage. It is very robust against both uh, feature and label noise, but uh, graph attention networks um, is uh, seems to be more sensitive to 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 feature privacy to feature noise when when the privacy uh, when the feature privacy budget falls below one. It means uh, that here in this in this regime the features are more noisy. And graph attention network, because of the calculation of the attention mechanism, is a little bit, bit more sensitive to, to the remaining noise in the features. So, so it has a little bit more uh, accuracy drop compared to the GCN and GraphSage. But for uh, higher uh, values of uh, privacy uh, budget for features, uh, graph attention network also shows the same behavior. Next, we, uh, we uh, actually, we do this experiment for, we, we compare the, uh, compare the LPGNN with multi-bit uh, features with different kind of ad hoc features. You know that we, we can train GNNs uh, without any features, okay? So we can kind of uh, come up with some sort of ad hoc feature for only for the sake of training, okay? So we want to see if the server uses uh, the features, the actual features with, with the privacy preserving mechanism. Is this case better than not using any feature and just use some sort of ad hoc features or not? Okay, so MBM is the feature coming from multi-bit mechanism. Here we, we set epsilon, X, epsilon of X to one. We also set epsilon y to one for the labels and the, the base genus graph sage. 
These are the, the ad hoc features. One is the all one vector. OHD is a uh, one hot degree for the nodes and R&D is just random initialization. And we can see that the, uh, the result for, um, for multi-bit mechanism uh, performs the result for, for, for the ad hoc features over, over all the four data sets, Quora, PubMed, Facebook, and Last.fm. So this means that using the, the actual features, the useful features, even in the private case is, is uh, better than just not using any feature. And uh, finally, we compared uh, different learning algorithms uh, for, for uh, learning with noisy labels. Here is DROP, our algorithm. We compared it to, to cross-entropy, which is basically uh, learning the, the GNN with the noisy labels directly. Uh, forward correction is, is, another, is another baseline for uh, uh, learning with noisy labels uh, that do not use the, the graph topology. Okay, so as a base gen, and again, we use graph stage, and here we set uh, epsilon x to one, and we perform uh, this experiment over different values of epsilon y, in, namely uh, 0.5, 1, and 2 over the three data sets, Quora, Facebook, and Last.fm. And here we can also see that uh, our algorithm drop can perform uh, better than, than the corresponding baselines, uh, especially for, for the data sets that uh, have higher number of lit, higher number of class uh, classes, for instance, on, on, on Last.fm, uh, with, with epsilon equal to epsilon y equal to uh, 0.5, cross entropy gets 21% accuracy, whereas with our algorithm drop, we can get like 70%, which is a huge improvement. So, as a summary, uh, we proposed a privacy preserving GNN uh, based on local differential privacy. So here's a list of our, our contributions uh, for high dimensional feature perturbation. We, we proposed multi-bit mechanism. Uh, we used uh, KPROP for both feature and label denoising. And for learning with noisy labels, we proposed uh, the drop algorithm. Uh, we showed that uh, GNN models demonstrate uh, a reasonable accuracy privacy trade-off. Uh, in other words, uh, for, for sim simpler models uh, like GCN and GraphSage, we saw that feature privacy almost comes for free. The models perform, uh, demonstrated very good uh, robustness against the noises in, in the feature, especially in the features. And for the labels, we, we saw that uh, uh, label privacy with, with low to moderate privacy budget gives uh, acceptable accuracy. So yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I would be happy to take any questions, if there are any. Thank you, Sina. Yeah, that's a great presentation. I have yet to see uh, one presentation that uh, combines differential privacy and uh, uh, graphs. It's a great presentation. Any questions, folks? Okay, if you have questions, please feel free to uh, ask him directly in our Slack channel. Um, and last we have, uh, oh, thank you, Sina. Um, and last we have our, our presenter, um, Meng Di, and uh, she is from a company in China called Mei Tuan, and she will be presenting graph embeddings and applications at Mei Tuan at large scale. So is she here yet? Great, there you are. Yeah. Hi, I'm Ming. Can you hear me? Yes, we can see you. So go ahead and uh, share your cool. presentation and we can okay. get started. It's all yours. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, give me a second. Yeah, no worries. Just go to share screen and. Uh... Are you able to find that? Uh, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can. Yeah. Yeah, 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 sure. 
Okay, thank you, Wuming. Uh, my name is Meng Di, and I'm from uh, Meituan AI Group. Uh, so glad to be here. And uh, thanks again for the introduction and invitation. And today I will talk about uh, um, uh, the graph embedding and the applications in Meituan. Um, uh, so my talk will uh, talk a little about the uh, JN technologies, but I will talk about uh, why we do it uh, in Meituan and uh, how we do it. Okay. Uh, first, we'll talk about uh, the Meituan Burn Knowledge Graph. Okay. Uh, for those uh, who are unfamiliar with Meituan, we are an e commerce platform uh, to deliver uh, foods and uh, uh, a lot of other uh, lifestyle services like uh, dining and uh, hotel transportation and, or entertainment services uh, from the merchants to consumers. Uh, well, there are a lot of uh, domain uh, business uh, in our platform. Uh, from the perspective of our data, we have uh, 1 billion products, uh, 200 million dishes, and uh, uh, like uh, 13, uh, 30 million PY and uh, uh, 7 billion user generated uh, contents uh, and 100 million concept. So we have a lot of data on our platform and we want to build a, uh, this, uh, build a knowledge graph to, uh, to describe how the uh, data uh, interaction with each other. Uh, here is an example for the uh, food knowledge graph we design in Meituan. Um, so we are we are designing uh, uh, a very complex uh, schema to describe uh, the relationships between uh, POI, uh, user concept, and the dishes. And uh, uh, behind this, uh, there are a pipeline to uh, extraction uh, information from our UGC text uh, and uh, to uh, fu fusion uh, different knowledge, data source, and uh, to do the knowledge graph, uh, uh, knowledge computing. So um, we follow the pipeline and uh, build uh, a lot of uh, different domain knowledge graph. Uh, started uh, uh, from the 2018, we first uh, uh, we firstly build a, a food knowledge graph, uh, then the concept knowledge graph and uh, salary knowledge graph. And uh, with the growth of our business, we move to the uh, e-commerce uh, products uh, knowledge graph, medical and hotel and uh, uh, travel knowledge graph. Here is a snapshot for our uh, platform. We also build an um, um, interaction system to uh, uh, for, uh, for the user to use our knowledge graph for search and uh, uh, um, QA bots. Um, uh, to build a lot of uh, other applications about this, okay. Um, after we have be, we have built a knowledge graph, we also uh, add a uh, the user uh, behavior log from our recommendation system and the search system to uh, to build a larger graph, okay. Uh, so here we have a very large uh, graph. And then we want to use uh, uh, graph learning techniques to, to learn the co-entity embeddings uh, from our graph. Uh, and we have tried a, a lot of models uh, from the shallow model like uh, random walk models uh, to uh, the today's uh, uh, GM models um, to learn the core entities like uh, query, uh, user, uh, salary, and the PI. Okay. So uh, unsurprisingly, we also use uh, the gen networks uh, and uh, here is uh, the structure for the uh, graph siege. So I think uh, everybody is very familiar with, with it. Um, after we have learned uh, the entity embeddings in our um, business, we want to use it in uh, our different uh, information systems like uh, recommender, search, and uh, deliver, uh, also the financial risk control system. Okay, um, here, is, here are the four examples uh, for how we build 
the graph and uh, uh, use it uh, in different uh, um, tasks. And today, I I'd like to talk more about uh, the first uh, uh, scenario in uh, how we uh, use graph mining in Recommender. Uh, so in our um, inmate one, um, uh, there is a very important recommendation problem called a, a PI recommendation, uh, which means uh, uh, we want to uh, recommend different point of interest like shop to, uh, to our user. Um, but we have uh, find, found out uh, that user prefers uh, different regions at a different time. Uh, below is an uh, example uh, about one user's records. Uh, we can see that uh, uh, the user uh, visit a different uh, um, shop uh, from a different region at different time. Uh, like uh, 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 we usually eat our breakfast uh, around our office and uh, take the lunch, uh, by the way. But uh, when we return home, we want to um, have our dinner around our house, right? Okay, so um, we build a, a user record multigraph to describe this problem. Uh, in this graph, we have the user, PUI, and the region entities. And we build a, a different uh, kind of relationship between user and PUI, uh, PUI and the PUI, and uh, uh, PUI and region. So uh, there is a, a mainly four type of relationship in our graph. Uh, uh, specifically, we build uh, a relationship called uh, visit time relationship. It means uh, how user visit different PUI at different time. So um, by this way, we can describe uh, a user uh, visit uh, a PUI uh, at different time. And uh, then we use uh, our JSON framework to learn uh, the graph learning uh, problem. Okay, so uh, here is the uh, very briefly uh, uh, framework design um, for uh, our problem. Uh, for more detail, you can refer to our paper published in SCDM 2020. Um, it turns out uh, 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 it works very well. And uh, the, the conclusion is that uh, uh, special and temporal information are really important in the PUI recommendation uh, problem. So here is uh, the reference for our paper. And uh, yeah, like, uh, the example in PUI recommendation, we have uh, done a lot of uh, practice in different uh, uh, tasks like uh, search and uh, um, a deliver system and other uh, kind of uh, scenario. And uh, right now we have uh, tried uh, um, uh, more than 13 online uh, tasks uh, in May 20. And it gains um, um, a huge effections. Uh, it, uh, it, it, it really helps, uh, yeah. The graph mending uh, turns out uh, um, very useful in our, uh, in our salary. So um, based on the observation and the practice, we then build a one-stop platform for the graph learning techniques. Uh, we also, uh, based on, uh, utilized uh, the open source uh, community tools like uh, uh, DGL and Ola. Uh, and uh, here uh, is um, a snapshot for our platform. So the core steps are uh, graph design, model define, uh, training, inference, and test, and, uh, um, and uh, uh, ANN, uh, vector searching engine. Okay, it's very uh, it's very uh, easy, but very uh, um, powerful base baseline to uh, build a, a different uh, uh, graph learning tasks in Meituan. 
So um, my talk um, today is very um, simple but, and brief. Um, I want to um, uh, I want to bring uh, a br bring up uh, uh, two questions to discuss uh, with uh, you guys, uh, and uh, there are two main uh, problems we are facing. And the first is how to automatically design the graph for different business scenery. Okay, uh, because right now we um, we. Uh, depend heavily on the expert knowledge to design different graph for uh, different uh, scenery. And um, the second problem is how to scale up uh, tabling um, scale, uh, tabling size uh, graph learning um, problem. Uh, because in in Meituan there are um, uh, there are very large uh, graph uh, in different uh, a scenery like uh, uh, we can build a food uh, PY similarity graph is a homogeneous graph. Okay, for one domain, um, it can be ten million. Uh, it can be a ten million size. Um, I mean, uh, in uh, it has a ten million nodes. Okay, but uh, if we want to build a search query log. Um, a graph, it turns up to uh, 100 million. Okay, if we want to, if we want to build a whole platform user interaction graph, it, it turns up to uh, 1 billion. And if we want to um, build a, a whole picture uh, for the Meituan brain knowledge graph, or uh, a Wikipedia knowledge graph, or um, uh, our user log uh, graph uh, in a 10 year uh, uh, scale, it turns out to be a 10 billion size graph. So it's very huge. Um, the biggest graph we have uh, tried on um, has been uh, a 100 million nodes and uh, uh, 10 uh, billion ages for now. So um, we are very looking forward uh, um, everybody's work on this area, so. Okay, um, that's all. And um, um, my talk uh, my talk is very uh, simple, but I, um, I'd like to share our uh, practice and uh, our uh, motivation why we want to use the uh, graph embedding technologies in Meituan. And uh, it turns out, uh, it graph embedding and uh, uh, GN technologies is very useful uh, for sure, but uh, there are still um, a lot of challenges ahead. Okay, thank you, that's all. Uh, thank you, Mandi. Uh, any questions? It's a great opportunity to ask uh, uh, Mandi. I know a lot of uh, uh, companies are you know, looking to implement very large scale uh, um, uh, graphs in practice. So any questions for her? Yeah, hi, hi, Mengdi. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I wonder what is the uh, pers persistence level? So do you use like a commercial knowledge, uh, uh, sorry, uh, commercial graph database uh, as a persistent level? Uh, uh, you just use the uh, uh, GN. Um, so I mean the storage level. You store store the data in in the in the I don't know where. So I yeah I'm 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 curious. Uh, if you if you if you use the uh, GraphDB. Um. Okay. Uh. We don't use any GraphDB in the uh, graph. Uh, learning problem, but we will use it in our uh, search system. Like uh, we have a, a platform to um, to uh, we have a, a, a knowledge graph platform for for users who want to uh, do the online queries on the knowledge graph. But uh, like uh, DGL, uh, we will do all our computing on the memory or GPU memory, okay? So we won't, 
we, uh, we don't use any uh, graph database uh, for the graph embedding problem. Oh, thank you. But uh, but you do use GraphDB for other part for the search part. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So so can I have the uh what what is can I can I know what kind of GraphDB you use? Yeah, it's also an open source uh, community called uh, Nebula, uh, from China. Oh, Nebula. Uh, yeah, oh. we have okay. tried a uh, genius graph, but um. Uh, it turns out the nebula can uh, hold up a a, a bigger uh, bigger or huge uh, graph. Oh, thank you so much. Welcome. Yeah. So hi, hi, Mandy. So this is Mindy. So yeah, uh, great, great talk. So uh, I have a question regarding to the inference part. Um, mm -hmm. So I wonder, like, are you guys doing online inferencing? Like, uh, do you, ha have you faced any challenges of like the latency problem? Like, because the graph neural network is pretty heavy uh, in a lot of senses, right? Do you feel yeah. like it is satisfiable for your business scenario right now? Like the, the inference speed, for example? Okay. Um, right now we don't do the online inference, but uh, we do a daily uh, style inference uh, from a batch uh, uh, for uh, for the whole graph in a daily style. You know what I mean? We don't do the online inference because in our um, in our uh, salary, uh, like uh, the recommendation system or search system, we can update the user or query and bending uh, every day and it. Uh, and it already satisfies the uh, the problem. Okay. Mm, I see. So um, oh, when you mean that, like you, you will update the embeddings every day, uh, will mm -hmm. you retrain everything from scratch because the graph is changed, or do, do will you actually adopt some like incremental training technique to to save the retraining cost? Um, yeah, we train the graph from from the start every day. Because uh, the graph uh, mm. have changed uh, a daily in our uh, in our in our scenery. Mm, like I uh, see. yeah, I see. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Because this is something like uh, we we face as well. Like the problem of the graph is uh, it has dependency, right? Like so, when you adding more data into it, the graph structure has been changed. So if the model is more like the, the transductive learning. Then, mm -hmm. then it needs to be retrained like every day. So, which is pretty painful because, like, uh, you, you can imagine like the, the the new data coming in every day is only a small portion of the full entire graph. But we want to, we need to do that over again from scratch. Um, yeah, I don't know whether you guys have thought about like good ideas to deal with that, or you, you feel like this is still not a problem for you right now. Mm. I think it's an uh, important problem to solve in the future. Sure, it's sure, for sure, uh, it's a uh, cost to train the graph uh, daily, but uh, right now it's um, it's okay. okay. Uh, I see. Yeah. All right. Uh, Leo from uh, Graphistry here. So this is fascinating, so thank you. Um, so I'm curious for, like you said, you have about uh, 30 plus applications using this. Um, do you have a sense of like is is it always like a like a like a full data science team who builds one of these or is it already at the level that just like a regular app team could just build their own? Uh, like, and, and, mean, and how do you think about that? Uh, uh, do you mean uh, how many people in our team? Oh, it, it sounds like there. Are th if you said, I, I think you said there are about 30 plus uh, applications using uh, GNN, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah it, were, were those made by your team or those made by different teams? And were those the people making them, would you view them as data scientists or more like engineers? I'm, I'm just kind of curious of the, the maturity. No, okay. Uh, there are 30 different uh, uh, systems, okay? Um, but uh, we all do, uh, but all those uh, different uh, online application are trained on our platform. So 
uh, we just uh, output uh, the core entity embedding for uh, all the 13 uh, online uh, system for different uh, uh, system like a recommendation or search. Uh, and uh, um, our actually our user for the graph learning platform is uh, uh, algorithm, algorithm engineer uh, almost. Okay, so more like a data engineer or algorithm. Engineer. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's awesome. Okay, I, I think that, that's very. Uh, actually, I have one more here is on the question about the database. Uh, so, is then the input if it's not input is not like a graph database? Is it more like a like a parquet file or like yeah, like how how do you feed the data in? Um, yeah, um, okay. Uh, for the knowledge graph database is a very interesting uh, question because uh, there are uh, triple A's uh, uh, database uh, like uh, uh, like uh, uh, RDF uh, database, right? But uh, we use the, the uh, a graph property uh, database like uh, Nebula because um, uh, they are, because it's a, uh, because there are uh, very little, uh, a, a very little uh, long pass uh, qu querying on our salary, you know. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, I, I meant for the GNN, not for the knowledge graph. So for the machine mm -hmm. learning, like um, what, what is for the input? machine learning? Yeah. Okay. Uh, for the machine learning problem, we don't use any uh, database. Uh, we don't use any graph database. We just uh, uh, input our data from the um, Hadoop uh, file system or uh, have. Uh, okay, so it's HDFS. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. HDFS. Yeah. Uh, we just uh, changed the uh, our data from the HDFS to our uh, and follow a graph design uh, schema and uh, change it to uh, our model inputs. That's the way how we do it. Uh, Avro, oh, to Avro or to our? Sorry, I misunderstood. Uh, um, well, okay, anyway, I'll, I'll ask you afterwards. I don't want to take up everyone's <laughs> time. <laughs> oh, sure, sure, sure. Okay, well, thank you, Meng Di. Yeah, appreciate the uh, presentation. Thank so you. I think Min we're already running late. So, anyone else has anything you want to share? Okay, otherwise I'll see everyone next time. So our next uh, uh, next uh, session is gonna be uh, August 26th on a Thursday. And I look forward to seeing everyone there. Um, once again, thank you all very much for joining today. And we'll, we'll communicate on the Slack channel. Thanks. We'll have the recordings ready as well. Thanks, bye.